1990, Charles Albright, he came to be known as the Eyeball Killer, the Dallas Slasher, and the Dallas Ripper. Known as Chuck Albright to his family and friends, was put on trial for the murder of three women. Although he is suspected of killing a fourth woman, they were able to try him for three. These women were prostitutes, and Charles thought they were throwaways. These victims were human beings, and they had families that loved them. A human life is a human life, and very precious, no matter what profession you decide to walk in. Let's talk about it. This story comes out of Texas. Here are four things about Texas you may not know. Texas state flag is called the Lone Star flag. The state flower is the blue bonnet. The state sport of Texas is the rodeo. And the capital of Texas is in Austin. Charles Albright was born on August 10, 1933 in Amarillo, Texas. He's the adopted son and the only child of Fred and Dale Albright. As a child, he was doted upon. His mother allowed him to dress as a girl and also play with dolls when his aunt was around. Dale Albright, Albright's mother, she nurtured him in his natural talents with the piano lessons. She gave him language lessons, among other activities that encouraged his mind to be stimulated. She also encouraged him in activities such as craft. Uh, psychologists will later blame her for his ghoulish obsession with some of the darker things that he got into. In 1944, Dale Albright enrolled her son in a mail order taxidermy course. Through this, he learned how to pop an eye out of socket without damaging the surrounding tissue. The family budget could not afford the expensive glass eyes for the stuffed animals, so Charles' mother gave him buttons to take the place of the eyes. Charles was a bright child who appeared to have a shining future, but as he grew older, a dark side emerged. By the late 1980s, Albright had a long history of criminal activity. He couldn't hold a job. And he was also accused of child molestation. And his life was just full of chaos. He would constantly get into criminal activity. He'd get parole or probation. And at one point, he served six months for stealing $380, a rifle, and a handgun. For the child molestation case, he was accused of molesting a nine-year-old little girl. He claimed that he was innocent but family and friends didn't believe him. The little girl testified against him. So he confessed in order, as he said, to just let it all go away. Authorities gave him probation for this crime. He did not serve any prison time. Charles lived in one of the houses that his parents had given him at an early age. When he was about 14 years old, his parents gave him a home. And he used that home to pick up prostitutes and bring them back at around 15 years old, pay them and sleep with them. One of the prostitutes gave him crabs. And that was at 15. Authorities suspect this is probably what started his obsession with prostitutes. When Charles finished his sentence of six months that he had served for the theft, he decided to enroll in school. He enrolled in Arkansas Teachers College. And while he was there, he committed small burglaries with the students. He would break into their dorms and steal their belongings. In one particular burglary, he stole a young lady's nude photos. And when authorities found out about it, he was forced to turn the photos over. While in school, he met his girlfriend then, Betty Nestor. 
Betty Dester, president's secretary. Some kind of way, uh, Charles convinced her to give him the keys. These keys were keys to every door inside the college. And he used those keys to break into storage rooms, to steal out of offices, to get into students' dorms without breaking in. He would just key himself in. And at some point, he got caught with a box of loot that was lined up, piled up by the door, and he was getting ready to steal it. When they discovered him with all of these boxes of stolen merchandise, he was expelled from the school. Charles' girlfriend, Betty, graduated, and she became a teacher. On December 27, 1954, when Charles was 20 years old, he married Betty Nestor. She became a teacher at Kimball High School. Now, Charles, he was rarely able to keep a job. He didn't keep jobs. He would get a job, and he would keep it for three months, and he would get terminated. Some of the jobs that he tried to test were manufacturing baseball bats. He tried to be an illustrator. He tried to be a designer for a plane airplane company. He even worked as a bullfighter. Charles continued to commit petty crimes up until the age of 41 when his wife decided that she'd had enough. He and his wife separated at that point, and he continued to commit crimes. In 1979, he was sentenced to a year's probation for stealing two perfume itemizers. He stole these things from a Dallas store. Uh, he actually cut the lock off of the store and went in, filled up a cart, and tried to push the items to his car and load up the car, and he was busted. In 1981, when Charles was 48, his mother, Dale, died. Um, he decided that he wanted to meet his biological mother, so he traveled and he met her. When he was 48 that same year, he was accused of molesting a nine-year-old little girl. Now, he claimed that he was innocent, and he didn't understand why his friends and the girl and her family believed such a thing about him. But he accepted a guilty plea, he claimed, so that he would not have things taken further and further prosecution against him. He did go to trial for this molestation case, but he only received probation. His father died in 1986, and Albright moved in with a lady named Dixie Austin. He was left $100,000 from his parents' savings account. And even with his inheritance, Dixie continued to work in a gift shop and she fully supported Albright and paid most of the household expenses and he'd help her out just a little bit. In 1987, Betty Nestor divorced Charles. Together they had had one daughter and he just continued to help her support the daughter as uh, parents living in a separate. In 1988, a lady named Rhonda boy who was 30 years old um, was found dead she had stab wounds but her eyes were not removed and uh, it buzzed around a bit that Charles may be linked to this crime but police were unable to link him now family says that after Rhonda boy was found deceased Charles became weird he started drawing pictures of mutilated women um, possibly the prostitute that he had murdered but people are not sure where he was getting these ideas from. And he just started to display really uh, odd behavior. He would mow his grass in his, in his underwear and collect books about serial killers. Mary Pratt was a 35-year-old who had been found deceased, dumped on the side of the road on the outskirts of town. When authorities found her, she had been shot in the head on December 11th of 1990. When her body was examined by the coroner, they discovered that her eyeballs were gone. Her eyes had been removed with a precision appearance. So whoever did this knew what they were doing. When the lids were shut, it looked like the victim's eyes were there. But when they opened them, they realized that they were hollow. It was the first time that a coroner had ever seen anything like this but it would not be the last. This was some type of signature from a monster. 
and the press dubbed this killing the eyeball killer. Two months later, a Dallas pathologist would examine a second murdered prostitute, and her name was Susan Peterson. She was 27 years old. Susan Peterson was found about a mile away in an area that was in clear view of the public. And just like Mary Pratt, her eyes were missing. Police speculated that the person responsible wanted people to see what he was doing. He wanted people to know that these women were being mutilated. On March 19, 1991, the body of a third prostitute, Shirley Williams, who was 41 years old, was again found on the side of the road in view of an elementary school. Like the other ladies, she had been shot. All three ladies were shot in the head and their eyeballs were all missing. But the killer was sloppier this time. There were cuts around the eyes, including one large gash that contained the tip of an X-acto blade. When this information was announced over the news that there was a serial killer amongst the population and he was killing prostitutes, Veronica Rodriguez, who was 26 years old, came to authorities and said that she knew the killer's identity. Rodriguez was heavily addicted to drugs and when she told the police her story, they didn't believe her. They thought that maybe she was just under the influence of drugs and that she was fabricating the whole thing. But she told them that Pratt and herself had gone off with a stranger to have a threesome. And this happened on the South Dallas Field area. Rodriguez recalled that the man became violent and hit her in the head with a gun. At that point, she was knocked unconscious. She said, but when she woke up, she saw him shoot Pratt in the head and she ran. She ran out the house and she saw a truck driver named Axton Schindler and she beat on the door and he let her in. Police stated that Rodriguez was scrambling up all these details and they didn't know what was factual and what was part of her drug-induced hallucinations, so they discredited her and they didn't pay any attention to it. The name of the man and the residence that Rodriguez pointed out didn't match the police description of the perpetrator. But what they found out after they did further investigation was the property that Schindler lived at belonged to a man named Charles Albright. And he was 57 years old and he was a former teacher. Now they found out Charles owned the piece of property and several other small pieces of properties around town. Now the coincidence was that the two dumping sites were near Albright's properties. Then there was Brenda White. Brenda White was 37 years old and she was a 20 year old veteran of the streets and prostitution. White said that one of her clients had tried to kill her. She was able to escape only because she had a can of mace and she sprayed him because she had a can of mace. Now the police are listening because there's two women that came forward and they gave similar but different stories but they all had the same description of the same perpetrator. Both ladies said that the attacker was a middle-aged white male with salt and pepper hair, and Albright fit that description. Police started to look into his background, and they learned that he was adopted by Fred and Dale Albright, that uh, his dad was a Dallas grocer, and his mom was a teacher who primarily... When she wasn't teaching, she did part-time real estate, and then she dedicated herself to her son, Charles. When the two ladies were called down to the police station, Rodriguez and White both picked Albright's picture out of a photo lineup. Police arrested him, and on March 22, 1991, they did a search of his home. In that home, they found stashes of guns, and an axe acto knife and collections of true crime books, books on serial killing, and they also found a thread and a hair in a vacuum cleaner and additional thread and hair in some old sheets. 
When the lab ran an analysis on the hair sample for DNA testing, it didn't come back to match any other victims. And it wasn't even Albright's hair. But what they found out is that the hair was from a squirrel's tail. And it became a key part in the case against him. When police went back and retraced the crime scene, they discovered that Miss Williams was killed in a field and she was moved. When they found that location, they found a raincoat, a yellow raincoat that she was wearing at the time. When they tested that raincoat for evidence, they found the same squirrel's hairs that were located in Albright's house and it connected the crime to him. They recovered the squirrel's hair from the coat and they also matched the ones from the vacuum cleaner and all three were a match. Investigators believe that both the killer and the victim picked up the squirrel hair at the scene. Albright was charged with four murders, including one dating back to 1988. But he went to trial, he only went to trial for William's death. The prosecution case was built entirely on circumstantial evidence, hair samples, and testimonies of prostitutes. During the trial, Albright's attorney claimed that he couldn't have committed the first murder of Mary Lou Pratt. He claimed that during this time, Albright was uh, delivering newspapers and that he had an early morning shift and that was his alibi. So he says that his customers saw him bringing the papers to their homes. So there was no way he could have been delivering papers and committing a murder at the same time. During the trial, some of his neighbors came forward and said that Albright was an amical guy. They said that he was the nicest neighbor, and they just adored him. They said he was the type of guy who, if he had a more, he would cut their grass. And sometimes he just gave them random gifts to be nice. Albright's attorney said that he could not be connected to the boy he murdered because... During the time of the murder, he was in New Mexico at a softball tournament. His witnesses and his alibi along with the fibers that were found, did not match him. And they were not able to charge him with that murder. An FBI agent, Judson Ray, for the prosecution, got on the witness stand and he said that he had never seen anything like this, that the precision cutting used to mutilate these three victims was something that he had never witnessed. He said what was interesting was that the method in which these victims and their body parts were taken. He said in his professional opinion, it's doubtful that you would have more than one person that deranged living in this city. The yellow raincoat that was linked to Shirley Williams had been shown to the jury. And the defendant's lawyer was able to have that evidence thrown out. He claimed that it tainted the jury because they'd already seen it, but the judge allowed it to be dismissed. During the trial, a prostitute came forward and said that she had made a false statement because she was forced by police. She claimed that the police had persuaded her to make a false statement against Albright in order to convict him. Albright was exonerated in the case of Rhonda Boyd. They were not able to get enough criminal evidence against him to convict him for that murder. Prosecutors tried to link Albright with all the damning evidence during the trial. They stated that the victims were all shot in the head with a 44 caliber. Now, they found a 44 inside of Albright's home, but the bullets did not match the victims. They also said that the uh, eyes were removed from each victim with an ex acto knife, and they found one of those inside of Albright's home. They said that the bodies were fully nude, or they had their shirts pulled up to reveal their breasts after being discarded in open spaces. One of the things that was very gruesome that was stated during court was they don't believe the victims were raped. They don't believe that there was any sexual act with the victims, but what they do believe is that when he removed the eye sockets, he penetrated the orifices of those sockets for sexual gratification. The prosecutor stated to the jury that Mary Pratt 
was shot and killed on December 13, 1990. She was the first victim of the eyeball killer. They said that even more shockingly that the coroner found that the eyes had been expertly removed from the sockets during the autopsy of the body. The case became unsolved because the mutilation was kept out of the media. The second victim, Susan Patterson, was discovered dead on February 10th the following year. Law enforcement stated that she was murdered in the same vicious way as Miss Pratt. This time, the media was made aware of the brutality of the victims. They called the murderer the Dallas Ripper. Law enforcement strengthened patrols in the killer's neighborhood, but it wasn't enough to prevent the third victim. Shirley Williams was discovered on March 18th, and again, her eyes had been removed by the murderer. But this time, there were some distinctions from the two earlier killings. Williams appeared to have been punched in the face, and there was bruising, and she had a fractured nose. The face was cut at the point of the axe acto knife, and that was also discovered in the eye sockets. He did a sloppy job, and he sliced her up with that knife, and this time they had knife markings where the other two victims didn't have that. In addition to the eyes not having been removed in the same accuracy as the prior two victims, when the bullets in the bodies of Mary Pratt were compared to ballistics, it was clear that the same firearm had been used to kill both victims and also Miss Williams. Miss Williams' body included a Caucasian male's pubic hair, and she was an African American. Unfortunately, they were not able to match Albright's hair to the pubic hair found on Miss Williams. The prosecutor's case started to crumble, and they were getting worried that they were probably going to lose this case as the other case with Miss Boy had been thrown out. When the jury went into deliberation, there were six women and three men, and they came out with a verdict. The verdict was guilty of killing Shirley Williams, and he was given a life sentence. His defense attempted to appeal, arguing that there wasn't enough evidence, but it was rejected. Albright was currently incarcerated at the Texas Department of Prisons in Amarillo, and according to reliable sources, he was still fascinated by the human eye and paid close attention to news reports about people who had been gouged in the eyes or had their eyes chopped out. It's unclear if he was a true eyeball killer, guilty of all three killings or perhaps only guilty of one. At the age of 87, Albright passed away in 2020. At the time of his demise, he still proclaimed his innocence for all four victims, and he also was still in the custody of the Department of Texas Corrections. Do you guys think that the prosecutors made a mistake and convicted the wrong man? Remember, the only evidence that they had was hair that didn't match, and they had the testimony of prostitutes who gave an account of this man and identified him in a photo lineup. Or do you think that Albright was a stone cold killer and he just got caught? Did Albright's mother create a monster in his early childhood when he was developing by allowing him to practice taxidermy? Leave your comments down below and tell me what you guys think about this. Don't forget to hit your notification bell so that when I post new content, you'll be notified. Be aware, be safe, and God bless you.